Vikings. The word calls up images of giants, grim warriors and fearless sailors capable of bravery and barbarism in equal measure. They hailed from the Scandinavian countries now known as Norway, Sweden and Denmark. The bleak, mountainous interiors of their homelands made them an outward-looking people from the start. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, they began pushing their longboats out from the fjords, scanning the horizons for precious land and sources of trade, and terrorizing the hapless Europeans who stood in their way. For more than 500 years, they swept into Europe, east, south, and west. The westward-looking Norwegians would move stepwise across the Atlantic, from the British Isles to Iceland to Greenland, and finally to a mysterious place called Vinland, somewhere in America. Every schoolchild knows that the rogue Viking Leif Erikson set foot in the New World long before Columbus's historic voyage. But until recently, just how the Scandinavians managed this navigational feat remained a mystery. The questions persist. Did they try to colonize the Americas? And how much of their seafaring skill did they bequeath to medieval Europe? I've sailed in, in these small, after all, small and open ships, the more respect I, I, I have gotten for, for these people. They were extremely brave. They must have been very, very clever um, shipbuilders, sailors, navigators. They must have been very well organized. And so, so uh, I mean, they were fantastic. Ragnar Thorseth adventurer from Norway, knows the seafaring ways of the Vikings as intimately as anyone. For the last decade, Forseth had dedicated himself to building replicas of Viking ships and sailing them round the world. What we have been interested in is to, to learn as much as possible about the ship, uh, seaworthiness, um, speed, uh, and of course, to learn how to, to sail them so that we better can understand how it was possible for the Vikings to not only to sail once across the North Atlantic but to cross it regularly 1,000 years ago. The archaeology of boats is a relatively new frontier in the science of the past. Working with scholars from the Viking ship museums in Norway and Denmark, Ragnar has tried to remain as faithful to the original Viking shipbuilding craft as possible. What is unique for, for, for Scandinavian, Scandinavian shipbuilding at that time is the clink building technique. Um, most ships are, today, are, the planks are, are like this, but the Viking ships, uh, it's more like this, and then they are nailed together. And, and you, first you build up the ships with the planking, and then later on you put in the ribs, while... Uh, uh, in most other traditions, they do, do it the opposite way. Thorseth's fleet consists of replicas of three ships. Gaia, a copy of the largest Viking ship yet found, built in 850 AD as a raiding vessel and probably once the property of a king. The Oseberg, a copy of a royal yacht dating from about 800 AD, is the most elegant of the Viking ships. The original was built for protected waters and never meant to see the high seas. The Saga Sigla, the most seaworthy of the three vessels, is an 11th century Viking trader. Well, if I were to cross the North Atlantic again, I would go for the Saga Sigla, the Knarr. But if I were to compete in America's Cup, I would go for the Gaia. Beautiful fast ship, really. The story of the Vikings' expansion is intimately connected to the characteristics of the land they inhabited, the conditions that drove them outwards. Europe was helpless against the pagan horde. Wielding axes and swords with gruesome skill, the Vikings knew no reason to spare civilians, women and children from their attacks. They ventured as far south as Spain, perhaps even sailing occasionally into the Mediterranean. In the ninth century, they grew strong enough to sack London and lay siege to Paris. They 
settled parts of Ireland, northern England, and conquered the city of York. Well, I think we've completely revolutionized people's idea of the Viking era in York. People used to think of the Vikings coming and just destroying the city, but we've seen a picture where they come and they inject new life into the place and they lay it out with the streets and the properties and the churches and the buildings, which you can still see today. The lines of the properties still exist a thousand years after, but they have their origin in the Viking Age. So the Vikings came as traders and as merchants and they gave York new economic life. From there, they struck out ever westward. The Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland. In the process, they became learned seamen. We are pretty sure that they were able to establish the latitude they were on, and that, that they would follow the latitude. Um, we are pretty sure that they had a sun compass to help them establish uh, the latitude. We also know that they were well familiar with the with the planets with the stars for instance the polar star they called called that the leading star so they would always know the true north uh, and of course any time when it was clear weather they would have the sun and the moon and the other planets um, the problems i guess uh, came up when uh, they for many days had bad weather and couldn't see the the, the sky then they could get lost and uh, but that was actually a good thing too, because the first man to, to get a sight of Greenland, he, he was lost. And also the first man, according to the tradition at least, to, to, to get the sight of uh, Vinland or America. He was on his way from Norway to Greenland and he got lost in a storm. And so... <laughs> The source for those westward journeys are two sagas, both of which tell of the volatile clan of Eric the Red. Theirs is a tale of discovery driven by violence and exile. Eric's father, exiled from Norway on charges of manslaughter, took his family to Iceland. Eric himself, exiled from Iceland after several fights and killings, set off in 986 to settle on the island of Greenland. Eventually, the colony would grow to several thousand settlers. It conducted brisk trade with Europe for several centuries. Uh, Greenland was a rich country. It had many resources which Europe wanted in the medieval period. Uh, things as prosaic as walrus hide, which were used for ships' ropes, uh, through things as mysterious as narwhal tusks, uh, which uh, throughout medieval Europe uh, was considered to be uh, the unicorn horn, the horn of this uh, sort of very mystical and uh, mythical uh, beast. The main commodity, however, was ivory. And uh, walrus ivory from the, the tusks of the walrus that uh, lived in uh, more northerly waters of Greenland was the main form in which uh, tributes and various tithes were uh, paid to Europe by the Greenlanders. Vikings continue to look westward across the Atlantic. According to the saga of the Greenlanders, one Bjarni Herofsson was driven off course while trying to reach Greenland and sighted North America in 986. He did not go ashore, but he carried the knowledge of the continent back to Greenland. In about 1000, Eric the Red's son, Leif, decided to strike out for the mysterious westward land to see if it might be suitable for colonization. According to the sagas, life's expedition first happened upon a barren landscape backdropped by mountains and glaciers. Life dubbed the place Helund, or land of flat rocks. Scholars believe this to be Baffin Island. Sailing southward, they then pulled ashore on a wooded place with a gently sloping shoreline and broad white beaches. This they named Markland, or Land of the Forest. It was probably Labrador. 
Then to the south of that was a third land, which they called Vinland. And this is the one that the questions are about. Uh, we don't know exactly where Vinland was, except that it was somewhere to the south of, of Labrador. For years, scholars have debated the truth of the sagas and the location of Vinland, even the meaning of the term Vinland. He spoke then the Norse language and said, I have something new to tell you. I found wines and grapes. The name Vinland was given to the land by Leif Erikson uh, in the sagas uh, because, as he said, because of the good qualities that it has. Now, this has been a controversy in scholarship ever since because uh, people want to, in uh, modern uh, days, see it as V-I-N with an accent on the I, Vinland, meaning land of wine or land of grapevines. But in Leif Erikson's time, they really had no knowledge of grapevines or wine. Uh, there was an old Norse word, uh, V-I-N, without the accent, Vinland, which referred to pasture, pasture land. And in fact, uh, any Norse explorer finding a new land would have had as his first priority to find pasture land. They lived on their cattle. They carried cattle with them in their ships as they went exploring. And their first priority was find a place for the cattle to graze. Well, Norse people would settle in a, in a land where, where the old pattern of culture fitted. I mean, in Newfoundland, they would find what they were used to, hunting seals, hunting caribou, and all that stuff. And uh, furthermore, it was very important to stop in time, don't sail too long, because I'm lived in the wilds for many, many years in the northern part, and, and the preparations for the winter, on that depends life and death. They had to build houses, they had to hunt, they had to fish, and prepare for the winter. It was here, in northern Newfoundland, that the definitive evidence was finally found. Norwegian archaeologists Helga and Anna Stina Ingstad spent the better part of a decade sailing up and down the Atlantic coast of North America looking for clues of the Vikings. In 1961, they arrived at Lons or Meadows. Dr. Ingstad is a Norwegian explorer, but his wife, Anastina, was the archaeologist. And they arrived in Lance and Meadows by accident, really, and they met with the local spokesman of the community, Mr. George Decker. Dr. Ingstead asked Mr. Decker if there was anything unusual, any humps or bumps or mounds around, and Mr. Decker said, yes, there are some Indian campsites up by Black Duff Brook. And there it was. Even if it was so overgrown as it was, and it was made very clear that it was remains of old horses. But we uh, didn't know, of course, who had built these houses. They might have been Indians, they might have been Eskimos, they might have been fishermen, it might have been whalers, and at last it might have been Norsemen. Only uh, excavation could tell the story. But personally, I had, a, I had a strong feeling from my experience in Greenland and in the western part of Norway that this was the place that the Norse people would like to build their homes. The Viking presence on North American soil some 500 years before the voyages of Christopher Columbus has now been definitively established at Lonceau Meadows. How is it possible then that such a monumental discovery would gradually fade from memory that by the time of Columbus the notion of sailing off the edge of the world would again lurk in the imaginations of European explorers? The answer? It probably didn't. In 1957, Yale University acquired a rather stunning map dating from the mid-1400s. On its western extremity appears the island of Vinland. 400 years after life's journey, 
and 50 before Columbus's. If authentic, the map proves that the reality of transatlantic crossing was still present in the minds of Europeans. Part of the controversy about the Vinland map is a question of its provenance. Uh, there are speculations that it did actually come from a Spanish library uh, in a private family library uh, that uh, was uh, perhaps uh, trying to avoid the Spanish regulation on exporting antiques, antiquities. Indeed. The map raised such intriguing questions that several scholars sought a simpler answer. It was a forgery. And close examination revealed that the ink on the document contained titanium oxide, a chemical available only in the 20th century. But I've shown a way that there could have been a transfer of this titanium dioxide into the ink in modern times as an accidental transfer during cleaning. In the mid-1950s, tissue paper of some manufacturer for a few years did contain commercial titanium dioxide, exactly the material that has been found in the map. There is, however, reason to believe the map authentic. On the upper left-hand corner is inscribed a long secret message in code, a cryptogram. The discovery of the cryptogram in the inscriptions of the Vinland map shows that someone went to an awful lot of trouble to incorporate these cryptograms in the inscription. One does not create a cryptogram hidden in an inscription except by an awful lot of very hard retrying work and uh, just one change of one word in this inscription could destroy the structure of the entire cryptogram. For a forger to go to all the effort to incorporate two cryptograms in two separate inscriptions in the map is very difficult for me to imagine. If the map is indeed authentic, it testifies that the Vikings had lost nothing of their navigational skills in the years preceding the momentous voyages of Columbus. Uh, Columbus did definitely know about the Vikings and their voyages to, to North, North America. Remember that Columbus was born less than 50 years after the last Viking ship sailed with, with, um, yeah, from Norway to Greenland. Uh, we also know that Columbus was in Bristol when he was a young sailor and uh, Bristol was an important harbor and they had lots of ships sailing up to Iceland and also to Greenland. Uh, so the Viking voyages, it was a living tradition. Um, some people also, or some science also say that Columbus went to Iceland, so he, he most definitely knew that there were uh, land on the other side of the big ocean. Mm. Greenlanders discovered or sailed to America. Uh, Greenland was, was uh, colonized from Iceland. And so when we think America being found by Europeans, there are mainly Greenlanders who sailed from Greenland to the continent of America. We don't speak of Christopher Columbus in this country. The Indians were there a long time before both Columbus and the Vikings, so uh, the Vikings were probably the first Europeans in, uh, in North America, um, but I mean they were there for a short period. Columbus of course uh, opened up America for the Europeans. It is too easy in this day and age to forget the true magnitude of the Vikings' achievements to underestimate the elemental forces they challenge. But Ragnar Thorseth is not likely to forget. In May 1992, the valiant trader, the Saga Siglar, and the elegant royal yacht, Orzeberg, founded in a sudden storm off the coast of Spain. Luckier than their Viking forebears, the crew survived to tell the tale and to build and sail Viking ships once again. What extraordinarily brave men they must have been. 
pushing their open longboats into the fjords of Scandinavia, setting sail for unknown hostile lands. An epic saga in themselves, these voyages wrote a heroic prelude to the European Age of Discovery. Leaving one to ponder, will we ever know the extent of the debt that Columbus owed his Viking predecessors? In the year 986, a Viking ship penetrated Arctic ice guarding the coast of an unknown land. The frigid waters teemed with life. A Viking colony was established at the very edge of the known world, in a country the settlers named Greenland. Three and a half centuries later, a ship from Europe put into the settlement. The sailors found the colony empty, abandoned, desolate. Why had the Viking settlers vanished? The bronze warrior marks the saga's beginning. A thousand years ago, Eric the Red led a fleet of Viking ships from this Icelandic harbor west into the unknown sea. It is a story that ends in mystery. History's tides have swept past man's fainter tracks, leaving only scattered patterns that seem to lead nowhere. Time has almost obliterated the adventures of one particular man. Eric the Red was an old-style Viking, earthy, wild, fiercely independent. Ten centuries ago, in Norway, Eric killed some king's men in a bloody fight. He fled to Iceland. He found the land already settled. Then, as now, its people were sheep farmers and fishermen. They had recently become Christians. And with the zeal of converts, built churches over the holy sites of their pagan days. The cults of the Old Norse faith were savagely suppressed, but Eric the Red continued to worship the Norse god Thor. July 1978. A small crowd gathers at a solitary farm in a rural district of western Iceland. They have come to witness secret rites banned since the days of Eric the Red. Sven Bjorn Beintansson has revived the old pagan faith. His followers call him All Share Your Goli, High Priest. We have all gods in our religion. Uh, our Vikings, the old Vikings, they, if they was going to sail somewhere, they asked the spirit, the sea god, and uh, battle god, the fight god, you know, okay. and then we celebrate and we drink for your healthy. This, this is a Thor's hammer. Thor's hammer symbolized the old Norse faith. It represented a thunderbolt, a mystic sign venerated in northern Europe since prehistoric times. Then Bjorn Beintansson leads his followers into a mountain sanctuary far from the roads and towns of modern Iceland. The 
Vikings worshipped the primal forces of nature. Chief deity was the sky god, ruler of storms, wielder of thunderbolts. After ten centuries of suppression, a horn of mead is once again offered to mighty Thor. On the plain near Thingvalir Falls, the past is celebrated. Modern Icelandic farmers assemble as their ancestors did in the summer of 982. Horses are judged today. A thousand summers ago, they judged men. Norse freemen gathered here to politic, to settle disputes. Times were changing. Life was becoming more orderly, civilized. That spring, Eric's axe had swung in another bloody brawl. Eric the Red was outlawed. Eric fled. He sailed west, west into the unknown. From northern mists loomed a massive island, ice-bound, uninhabitable, but for a narrow strip of land on its southwest coast. Here, Eric's people settled, optimistically calling their new home Greenland. They homesteaded, building houses and barns, enclosing pastures and fields. But even in Greenland, Eric the Red did not find complete refuge. Eric's wife raised Greenland's first church, she barred Eric from their home until he agreed to give up pagan ways. But evidence suggests the old Viking's conversion was not complete. Greenland's fjords could not sustain the colony. Crops would not grow. The land's wealth was to be reaped only in its wilderness. Small groups of Norse hunters fanned out through a vast expanse. Arctic seas soon wrecked their long ships, but they pressed on in small open boats on voyages that must have lasted years. Rarely were European ships able to journey to distant Greenland. Years elapsed between visits, but a few Arctic treasures lured traders to venture west. One of those treasures was the Jeer Falcon. Sultans and caliphs offered coffers of gold for a live Greenland falcon. Arab court geographers told them this fierce and most valuable hunting bird came from world's end, from the fabled Ultima Thule, the land farthest north. Norse hunters pushed beyond the edge of the known world. Narwhal, the great horned whale of the high Arctic. In distant Europe, Medieval alchemists sold the whale tusk as unicorn's horn, ground into magical potions. A single narwhal could make a hunter rich for life if he survived the vast, uncharted wilderness and succeeded in making his way back to Greenland. Few returned. Fewer ships arrived from Europe. The Norse Greenlanders sank into ever deeper isolation and were lost to history, except for a single brief reference. In 1300, church annals noted that a Greenlander had been burned at the stake for secretly practicing the old faith. After that, there is only silence. In the summer of 1342, a ship put into the western settlement. 
It carried a bishop sent from Europe to investigate why the Greenlanders had fallen behind in their church tithes. The Norse farms were empty, abandoned. There was nothing else, no messages, no signs of life. The settlers had simply vanished. For the last 600 years, the fate of the Norse Greenlanders has remained one of history's most baffling puzzles. In 1921, archaeologists dug near Cape Farewell at Greenland's southern tip. They found a church graveyard and the huddled remains of hunchbacks, dwarves, sterile cripples. Was the mystery solved? Had the Norse colony died out from inbreeding and malnutrition, from severest cultural isolation? At the cemetery's edge, pointing west toward America, was a coffin, nearly seven feet long and empty. The withered end of Eric's people, or only the poor and weak left behind. The search for the lost Vikings of Greenland leads us to the northern coasts of Canada. Here, even in summer, Arctic seas rage. Travelers peer anxiously into the distance, looking for the signs of safe harbor that mean Payne Bay. Payne Bay, swept by fierce tides, frigid, remote, yet teeming with life. The richest caribou lands in Canada's eastern Arctic. Bear, trout, char, seal, and whale. High above Payne Bay, visible at sea for many miles, stand three beacons. It is believed they predate Columbus' first voyage to North America by centuries. A 500-pound rock crowns 15 feet of carefully laid stone courses. Yet the primitive Eskimo who roamed here when these sea beacons were built were four feet tall and lived in holes roofed with whale ribs and animal skins. Professor Thomas E. Lee of Quebec's Université Laval has spent 12 years seeking the builders of Payne Bay's curious ruins. Lee has developed a theory not accepted by some experts. The modern Canadian Eskimo community of Payne Bay has proved a rich source of information and has led Lee to develop his unique theory. Hello, Thomas Lee. Modern technology has overwhelmed the ancient lifestyle of the Inuit community. Where once the young learned the ways of the Eskimo from their fathers, now state-run schools provide education and gradually the old ways are becoming dim memories. Vaguely remembered are the legends of dwarves and giants that roam the land. The tunic. Legends that reach deeply into the Inuit past. This is my grandmother, Miniana Hatak, and her grandchild, Lali Anahatak. Mrs. Mini Anahatak was born 79 years ago in the igloo of an Inuit winter hunting camp. Professor Lee records tribal memories he believes date back nearly 800 years. Uh, his parents, Anahata got this story from his parents, and they got this story from the Inuit who lived in Saklak. That's why they got this story. And they could lift big stones. Yes, they've heard that they were uh, fairly strong. What kind of people were they? There were two kinds. Big and small one, even they were small one, they were still strong. So there was almost a giant tunics and also the small tunics. Now why they were scared of uh, Hadlunaks? Because it was the first time they met Hadlunaks with white skin and bushy beard. They were different. Than Inuit. They had beards. <laughs> or maybe they had bushy eyebrows, <laughs> etc. <laughs> 
I first saw Pamiak Island in 1966. I had two Eskimo or Inuit with me, one of whom was an old man by the name of Zachary Aze. Professor Lee has made a series of spectacular discoveries in this seldom visited region of Arctic Canada. He believes that he has identified the legendary tunic. Near the Payne River's mouth lies Pamiok Island. When I first saw it, it was in a wild and beautiful setting, in a sort of an amphitheater. It was extremely impressive because of its great size and setting. Zachary Aze took me across the island and, and then left me and pointed in, in the direction in which I should go. And he said it was built. Well, he would express it by saying, before, 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 before. The central buildings in ancient communities were the longhouses, communal sleeping quarters. The Pamiok Island longhouses provide Dr. Lee with a basis for his theory. This enormous longhouse was 83 feet long and 20 feet wide inside dimensions. It was rather ship-shaped with the walls out curving a little bit. And this is the, the north room, the uh, sleeping quarters. The stones in the walls were very heavy. This particular stone weighs over a thousand pounds. And here we enter the great hall with 11 fireplaces down the center. And since there were 11 food storage pits on the outside of the building, I think it is very obvious that there were 11 families. And if we suppose that there were five people in each family, then we have a, a approximately 50 or 55 people living in this longhouse. And that, of course, means social organization far beyond the scope of the Eskimo. People who lived in this house were, in my opinion, Norsemen. I think that they were hunters from Greenland, came here just the men alone and probably they married native women and had half-breed children. This was a very rich hunting place. It still is. Professor Lee believes that a handful of Viking hunters cut themselves adrift from the dying Greenland colony and settled here in North America, eventually fathering a tribe of mixed bloods. Lee's theories have been hotly attacked. His opponents claim the longhouse was built by Eskimo. Yet the nearest forests that could have supplied beams for its caribou skin roof lie 150 miles to the south. They could only have been brought by ships, which the Eskimo never had. The Eskimo were well adapted to this environment. Never would they have built such a drafty, cold structure. Lee believes it served as a primitive palace. That longhouse was a part of a complex which extends up the coast all the way to Diana Bay, about 70 miles farther north. You find these longhouses at intervals along that distance. And I have thought about this as being a sort of a kingdom. An Arctic kingdom whose leaders were Norse and whose followers were Stone Age Eskimo. The remains of their crude tent rings still crowd around the longhouse. The Eskimo had much to learn from Iron Age Europeans. Excavating carefully, Professor Lee found the weathered blade of a Norse battle axe. If we put out from this small bay and sail on a course that is due east with a favorable wind, in one week's time we will come directly into Eriksfjord on the southwest coast of Greenland. Did a remnant of Eric's people at long last find refuge here in this Arctic fastness? Set on a ridge not 50 yards from the great longhouse, these stone tombs crown Professor Lee's sensational findings. In them, he discovered what he believes are the remains of a primitive Eskimo, a mixed blood, and that of a medieval white male, the first and only pre-Columbian European skull ever found in the Western Hemisphere.
Lee's discoveries have stirred fierce controversy. Textbooks are not easily rewritten. Old theories tell us that past cultures lived and died in strict isolation, but new ideas suggest that mankind's evolutionary steps may have been closely linked. In death, the Norse Greenlanders gave birth to a new kind of Eskimo, bigger, stronger, more skillful, whose descendants still hold the land farthest north. A day's journey upstream from the Payne River's mouth, modern Inuit pitch a hunting camp. Yeah, I saw a lot of tracks. This is the only one we saw. Centuries pass, but Arctic life does not change. 22 Magnum. Hunters still travel the river in search of caribou. I think that we have just begun to get at the answers to the Norse presence in Ungava. We've just scratched the surface. We, we have not finished with the Payne Lake evidence by any means. We need at least one more expedition in there. And along the coast of Ungava, out this way, we have reports of longhouses that we have not been able to see. I think there may be a great deal of evidence remaining. In fact, I sus suspect that we will find more things in the interior someday when we do some thorough searching. On the heights above the camp stands a beacon that points deep into the North American some interior. Some people say that this was made by the Inuit or the Eskimo. But as you can plainly see, this is a Thor's hammer. <laughs> 